but still in our country mr pawar i feel we are not you know we've still not scratched the surface to ensuring that education reaches everyone jaise technology ke aane ke baad bhi it's a responsibility when we pay taxes to the government for them to take care of water air health and education test match with the rigor of one days <laughs> and that's what we have to perform as entrepreneurs with a lot of joy corporate does governance doesn't cost money so if you keep your eye on the ball the scoreboard will take care of itself how many of you have uh, heard of niit matlab mujhe puchna chahiye how many of you have not heard of niit because uh, while growing up for me i still remember coming of course uh, 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 all these engineering and everything scared me but coming from bihar when when went to delhi har jagah dikhta tha holding niit and uh, it was an aspirational place to get into niit to get into uh, something and now when we are seeing so many edtechs and so many different players coming in education what we have to not forget and that's why i have really requested mr pawar to come here and talk to us and be with us is that uh, like roni was saying that kabhi mango season hai kabhi pomegranate hai but there is a season uh, there is an evergreen season a season where you build a business which lasts which endures which is sustainable and which doesn't rely a lot on external capital how do you build that how do you build a sustainable business and it's so important this year that we have this conversation where we have last two three years just heard about funding valuation and how you know billions of dollars of businesses are being created overnight so mr pawar first of all thank you i know you have taken out time to come from delhi to be here in mumbai to talk to the entrepreneurs so thank you i would like to first begin with and i i have my two questions now mixed together is uh uh you know one is about byjuice which was still a year back the most valued startup in the country 30 billion dollars of valuation and niit has been there uh, for a very long time and helped so many of us uh, to be where we are when you see all these things one what do you read of it and second i want to ask you how do you build a brand which withhelds all these you know newness that comes and goes away but niit keeps standing how do you do that what does it take to build a sustainable trustworthy brand so the thanks um, for for having me here for a number of reasons <clears throat> so i am one of the uh, people involved with nascom from the beginning and this hall reminds me of the days when we were of that age so it's nice to be here because now when i come here for nascom the average age is very much more than what we see here so we like to be back here among the people who are building india today and i have to tell you a little story to define the mindset that time and narayan murthy told me this soon after that he had gone to mysore which is his hometown and they had a campus there and he was going past and his father was a government servant so he went past that colony of small houses and just got tempted to go to his home yeah. so he goes there knocks there and there are two young girls parents have gone to work these are students so he's chatting with them and he says uh, talks to the elder one what are you doing she says i was thinking of it but now all that is over this was the mindset of the world in 2001 about it when the dot com bust happened so what the wise people told us then is and the sentence i want to say to everybody is is that this too shall pass yeah so for me this had tech up and down well this too shall pass that's the first message i want to give to anyone who has anxiety because ups and downs will happen that's the nature of the world and therefore it will be different players at different times who uh, many will grow some will have some missteps and if the missteps are fatal then it becomes a big story but many will sustain so this too shall pass 
to your the second part of your question i think the real thing is uh, perhaps i take the analogy of cricket to simplify it so when you are batting your eye can either be on the ball or it can be on the scoreboard so if you keep your eye on the ball the scoreboard will take care of itself if you keep watching the scoreboard too much you'll go out for a duck i think this is the fundamental principle everybody here has got on to doing something and that something is not to keep looking at the scoreboard the scoreboard will take care of itself you started doing something because you think that something that excites you or you started doing something because everybody is doing the same thing so quite quickly you have to start figuring out why am i doing what i'm doing am i doing it because this is the thing to do am i doing it because everybody is willing to fund it and again uh, it's not easy to come to these conclusions but i think you have to ask those questions to yourself why am i doing what i'm doing and the logical thing you look for is is there a market and if it if i can sell it for 10 will it cost me 5 or 6 or will it cost me 12 so some of these common sensical con- conversations are the starting point yeah. but they are not the enduring point the endurance comes and you've asked me that question that what you are doing should give you joy very important point because most of us as entrepreneurs and i can tell about myself also many a times when the journey is long then the joy disappears sometimes you get very fatigued also and i want to ask you i'll come to that question uh, is that many a days are not very joyous days uh, and i know you and i have known you and i know the integrity commitment and some sort of joy that you have brought in the sense since last one and a half years of my conversation with you and i'll bring i'll come to that because most of us have not seen the longevity that you have seen in terms of being an entrepreneur and running a business so i'll come to that but before that sir for everyone if you could tell us about niit where it is now and also how it is engaging with entrepreneurs and startups in particular so uh, we started out with a very simple mission in 81 of bringing people and computers together successfully that was the motive how many of you were born in 81 <laughs> not born in 81 three <laughs> so that time the uh, so i had been involved in the computer industry before i was in hcl looking after corporate planning and when we were looking at growth projections you know you do the swot analysis so it was becoming very obvious that the sector has potential for growth and what will hold it back will be talent so what was looking like a constraint became in our minds the thing to do last few days there's a lot of conversations we are doing about gen ai and what it will do and what it will do to jobs my simple answer is even if globally the jobs reduce they will all come here and we will do gen ai for the world so the talent question which was a very restricted question for us to say talent for the it sector 20 years we were focused on that and that continues to grow but then we started looking at the banking sector 2006 mr kamath who was then head of icic and they've been our bankers from the beginning he actually called me to say look now the banking sector is going to grow and we don't have the talent so then we embarked on the whole issue on banking now we train hundreds of thousands of people on banking related jobs and now last year year and a half my personal focus is what are the next one or two big waves so therefore looking for needs which are going to be at scale becomes a starting point but then as i said it has to give you joy so that's another discussion yeah yeah and uh, and i also know that you are engaging with a lot of and supporting a lot of young startups if you could tell us about that 3 years ago when the big problem started uh, we were aware that edtech had attracted a very large number of bright people and many of them not because they loved edtech or they loved education but there was money coming in and everybody wants to start with money so and then it all went up for a couple of years well five years it was going up and during that time far too many bright people who shouldn't have been in ed tech got into ed tech because that was as we see not their real passion but it was a, it was a smart thing to do and also a lot of people who really were good at it so when the 
the problem started off a couple of years ago. We figured that there were many bright young people who were in this field who I was encountering all over the place who were going to get hit for the wrong reason. So then we felt that, okay, even NIT as a brand has a responsibility to build the industry, let's say this, which is what we did when we started the, the, the organization 81. We built a whole set of competitors, 100 companies by 1990 in the industry. So we felt that it's important that we reach out to edtechs at the early stage who have good ideas, who may have the passion, but who need help at that stage. So we started something we call the EdTech Virtual Summit. And uh, that was two years ago. And last year, you helped us all to, also to take the message out. And a few hundred people attended virtually. And then out of that, we handpick a few of the type which I talked about. We see it's passion in their, their eyes for the area. And uh, then we take them to a university. We've, uh, as founders, we created a university in 2009, 15 years now. And then we have a three-day immersive growth camp for them, which is where we got other, we call other senior people. We have my founders, our directors, and so on. And that is where we really do serious mentoring and then also find people who come in front of these people. So this is growing now, and we expect that it will grow. So this is a small contribution to people who are in the sector who we think should stay in the sector and who need the support. You know, I... I think about this and I'd asked this to Ronnie Struvala who was here in the morning and I think also to Mr. No, to Ronnie I had asked him this is, you know, many of us are here in this room because of the education, or the, nothing else because I'm myself from Bihar and I've talked about this is that I could be where I am is because So, <laughs> and education I think is the only currency to change the status, social status, equality status, economic status. But still in our country, Mr. Pawar, I feel we are not, you know, we've still not scratched the surface to ensuring that education reaches everyone. Just like technology ke aane ke baad bhi, uh, quality education at affordable pricing. What do you think as a country, and we have government officials also in the room, what are some of the things that we could do still to get there? So this is an unsolved problem, and I'm coming to a conclusion from a government point of view, it's an unsolvable problem because education, and everybody in this room will relate with this, is basically a public good. Yeah. Like healthcare is a public good. It's a responsibility when we pay taxes to the government for them to take care of water, air, health, and education. Yeah. And yet, there are conflicting priorities for a nation which is growing. There's defense. We have problems on the borders. We yeah. can't ignore them. There are kind of existential issues. So the funding that should go to education, which we have set for the last 40 years, should be 6% of GDP has never gone past 3%. Mm -hmm. So if it was 6%, then like we have managed to get every child into school now at least, but then there are drop-offs. We are now having to get the remaining 3% from the non-government sector, which is what creates the opportunity. Yeah. But remember that comes at a cost. Yeah. So reaching out to people is a government responsibility and we are just filling the gap. right? But then we fill the gap and then comes the question of a learner who says, look, this education should come from the government, but someone is asking you to pay for it. So the EdTech entrepreneur has this social burden to carry. That when you do something, how clear are you that if someone puts their money on you, they will get something back? That really is the question. The mistakes which have happened, we have to draw lessons from mistakes yes. that happened. The mistakes that have happened is that people have not understood their responsibility while making an offering or they made promises which they didn't think through whether they can meet or not. And the huge backlash of the last couple of years is basically not understanding your responsibility when you make a promise and then not being able to fulfill the promise. That will apply to whatever sector you are in. Yeah, right? yeah Whatever yeah, yeah. sector. But in this sector, I think the expectation that you is my life and you're playing with my life, I think that causes far more severe gaps. If it's a chocolate or something as you don't like it, throw it away, you have another choice. You take another chocolate. But if you spend a year learning something, that year doesn't come back. 
So therefore, I think to, to your question that it's a responsibility and therefore I keep saying if you're getting into ed tech, remember you have a social responsibility. No, no, so true, so true. You have to look in the eyes of the parents. Like uh, uh, I want to mention that someone freelancing with us here, I was in IIT Bombay uh, two weeks back and his son, uh, uh, you know, he wants his son to clear IIT and he got his son on a Sunday to talk to this engineer and uh, I could see there was so much of hope in the father, right? And because the the status will change. And, and that's why what you are saying is so important, not just for the tech, but for all of us as an entrepreneur. What you're saying is that if we are an entrepreneur, we need to have a social, not social responsibility in what we do. Thank you, Mr. Pawar. This is important. And this is important that we remember. Coming to corporate governance, you know, looking at you only, I know that you would be a corporate governance follower and an NIT has done a fantastic job in the way you conduct yourself. Last two years, three years, startups have come under a lot of attack on the corporate governance and you're saying that as companies, we're not building it in the right way. What would you like to tell us? One or two things, because one, one question which as a startup founder I could say is that mere paas paisa hoga tab corporate governance hoga. Right now, I'm too small to think about it. No, I think there's a very, very wrong view. Corporate does, governance doesn't cost money. You have to get that right first. Corporate governance, so let's look at two or three things. Corporate governance at the basic level means that are you doing things right? That's what it means. Now, it also means that if you think you're doing right, but you're actually wrong, what's your mechanism to tell you? that you're not right. That's the second part. So when we say we have a board, you need not have a board if you're not a comp listed company, or, but you have a set of people around you. And subordinates who work with you, how do you get corporate governance through them? To me, the, the answer has been very clear that you make yourself vulnerable to your subordinates. They should be able to come to you and say, this is not correct. Now that needs a culture to be created, but doesn't cost money. Yeah. So corporate governance is basically about making sure that you're, you're mindful that what you're doing is right to all stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? Customers are your first stakeholders. So how, how well are you organized to make sure that what you're promising to your customers is what they want? And how sure are you that what you're promising will be delivered? This is one part of corporate government. Doesn't need anybody else to tell you. Second is that if you are, how responsible are you with the money you have? Initially, it's your own money. If it's your own money, if that was the only way, you'll be careful. But now someone gives you money. It could be a bank, it could be a friend, it could be someone else. If they've given you the money, how responsible do you feel to them to give it back? Again, it's an attitude, doesn't cost you money, right? But people want to build mechanisms to make sure that you are responsible. So what I actually get surprised by is that highly established venture capitalists give money and are not exercising judgment. So there could be corporate governance, there should be corporate governance with that. When it's banks, they will obviously come and want your reports and if you're listed, then they say you. So you don't have to wait till that time. Just build simple principles, make yourself vulnerable, have a team where you empower them to tell each other when it's wrong. That's all there is to govern. I had a question which I, I want to ask you is that, uh, and again, we don't have much of this conversation in our, in, you know, among us as entrepreneurs is, you know, it's very difficult to every day be joyous and happy and purposeful because when we start a business, we start with a lot of excitement. Then life happens and it's hard and, and you're struggling for money, building a team, getting the customer. And there is a fatigue that sets in more often than not. And there's also a disappointment, frustration, and, and you have to again show up every day looking good and proper. Mr. Pomar, and this is to you, because I know you have stood with stood for so many years with so much of excitement and see there is so much of purpose and joy. Practically how do you how do you how do you make this happen? See, for when, so long. 
when we started our careers, the life was meant to be a working span where you sign off at 58. But everyone here is going to work till you're 100. I don't know, maybe even more than 100. I don't know how bored you'll get, but you will be working for a very long time, first thing. And therefore, to imagine that you will do exactly the same thing throughout is probability is not very high unless what you are doing, what you are doing, not how you are doing, how is the problem, you have tension, pressure, and, but what you are doing gives you an innate sense of joy. So the word passion started getting introduced about 20 years ago, right? I have passion, I'm very passionate. And you have to ask people five questions about why they're passionate, it'll come to because there's such a big market, right? So the question you have to, and I'll, I have to tell you this, it's not easy to find out. I've been asked this question from the beginning that, you know, why, why do you get, why do you carry on doing this? And it took a long time to come to a very important insight which I share with my colleagues and co-founders, which is, I'll put in simple word, it gives us joy to see people grow. It's as simple as that. So what you do, if it gives you joy, you'll never feel fatigued, you'll feel tired, you'll never feel bored, you'll never feel bored. So, so growth as, a, as an idea, so I love farming, I, veget I grow vegetables, I grow fruits. You know, you put a seed and you keep waiting till the day something comes out. Some people don't find it exciting, I find it hugely exciting. So what is it that gets you really a sense of joy? Yeah. Figure that out. Now you may not figure it out in your first startup. It's possible. Your first startup may run on the tailwind of opportunity and funding. But you keep asking yourself that question. And people who sustained are people who come every day with the same set of curiosity, who are carrying books on the new books on the subject, who are reading all the time, right? And who are maybe writing or not writing, but curious about that area. So a sense of joy has to be the starting point. And that may happen in your first start startup, your second, your third. But when it hits you, you'll never see boredom. You know, when you were answering this, I was thinking of test match. Test match with the rigor of one days. <laughs> and that's what we have to perform as entrepreneurs with a lot of joy. Yes. Uh, with this, if you have any questions, then please quickly come and ask. Uh, I just want to ask you that when you start off uh, an entrepreneurial journey, is it how do you actually validate that is this a good idea worth going forward or not? Is it that you go with a gut feel or you actually do an extensive market research? Um, right. So could you just explain a little bit? So it's not one or the other. You obviously have to do basic understanding. But very often, if you're, if you're curious, you're seeing what's happening around you, you haven't just come out of college, you've dealt with the world a little bit, you can start figuring out where are the gaps in the market? What are some unmet needs? At a gut level, you have to feel it first, right? So in my case, as I told you, we were looking at IT, we could see it very clearly. So then you have to do a certain minimum validation, right? To see that what's happening in this space, who are the other players? In our times, it was very difficult. Today, you can get, you know, all the details. You can ask Gen AI to make you a study of what the demand supply, and it will be reasonably accurate. That you need to know. That's a bare minimum, right? Because otherwise, you'll be uh, not bored, but you'll get tired by creating a market which doesn't exist. You'll get tired by finding other people who are as excited about you because the market doesn't exist or there are unsurmountable problems. So gut feel as a combination, then some basic study, but a combination of that's required. You do have to do a bit of that and today's time you can get a lot of information. Uh, what I'm working on is in the B2B space and it is a very niche space in the pharma, in the pharma market, right? Where it's very difficult to actually get market results. You need to literally pay, uh, pay lakhs for a report. I'm not even exactly sure whether that will contain the information that I'm looking for. So any, any thoughts around that? Is it that you just start working on uh, with your co-founders and, and at an appropriate time having conversations with your potential clients, you, uh, you know, get more and more idea. Yeah, so everybody will say that B2B is easier than B2C because you can have an extended conversation which is the combination of rationality means that is there a demand. So it's, it's a rational discussion versus a consumer who may be you know, not so predictable in terms of their mood swinging and changing. So 
So I'll give you the example. We started with IT more intuitively, but the banking question for us was a B2B. So Mr. Kamath said, look, the banking sector has a problem. And he, in a sense, is one of the smartest bankers. Now he's heading geofinance. So he could explain to me the needs they have. But he had no clue where the people will come from. He had no clue of how we will teach what we have to teach. So we could apply our lessons to a market that someone has helped us to identify. But we did it with a difference. And we, this may apply to some examples. So we told him that, okay, we are willing to build the talent for the banking sector, but you have jobs. Will you put your skin in the game? And then we built a model, which was as follows, that we would advertise jointly. So people come there because of the ICICI name, they're going to give a job. And the commitment I got out of uh, Mr. Kamath, and you have to do that if you're doing B2B, to get skin in the game, is we said, when we give an, an admission letter, you will have to give an appointment letter. Understood. Which will be subject to attendance or whatever else. And 98, 99% of the tens of thousands of people who still come through the process go through that. Now, what that did was it solved the problem, which is what we are trying to do since day one. So we have said that if you come to us, we have a commitment to make to you. Why we chose not to do, for example, the test prep business is because out of a hundred people who pay money, maybe less than one gets what they want. So which is okay. I have no problem with that. But I have a no. I don't have a. I don't have a problem with them doing it. But I have a problem because the the like you said, the parent sell their home to send the child for something. Obviously, the probability is less than 1%. So you have to look at that probability question and find ways. So to me, this was an area we didn't know. But a person who trusted us, ICSE has been a banker since the beginning. Mr. Kamath, as a young banker, his first check signed as a loan was for NIT. Is that old relationship, right? So if you have B2B prospective customers, you have to just tell them what you're trying to do. And believe me, if you're passionate about, about what you're doing, you will find a person who resonates with your idea. And if B2B is a starting point, it's easier because building a brand is expensive. It's cheaper in India. In our days, it was very cheap. We would put full page ads every season. Now, building a brand has become expensive, right? So you zero in. You may just say, okay, I'll just do it in this part of Bombay to start with, rather than saying I want to conquer the world in one shot. And I want to make one more point here that people want to build a brand. Building a brand, I want my def definition of building a brand is a brand is the residue that is left after the transaction is over. A brand is not a promise. It becomes a promise when the expectation in the marketplace has been created, experience has been created. So don't hesitate to start small. See, we hear about people becoming unicorns when they've been at it for 10 or 15 years. We only hear it that day. He says, oh, I heard them about them yesterday, they become unicorn. Nothing works like that. That's a matter of chance. And there you have to be careful, otherwise you can have a collapse, which has happened in many sectors all over the world. So what you're trying to do, you have to prove it first. So you call it product market fit, whatever terms you use, but cut out the theory of it because there are consultants who can cost you a lot of money, reports. You're, you're doing something which has a value for somebody else. Personally test it out with as many of those people as possible. Build the first experiences. So when we diversified into software, we did a project for companies. Our commitment has always been to our customers. If you've made you a promise, if we can't fulfill, we pay your money back. And we had paid back in the one case here of a company called Bajaj Electricals, which is that he went to the checkbook and said, Mr. Bajaj, sorry, we fouled up. He called his guys, he says, these are the people I want to work with. So your personal commitment to create value for someone and building experiences in the, build, in the beginning which keep a positive feedback. That is the basis of building a brand, not a billion dollars or a million dollars to be spent. That's the wrong way to solve the problem. As someone who's been interested uh, and gotten really uh, into this whole aspect of coaching and training, uh, I wanted to understand from you first, 
what are the key attributes that you would want, uh, you would say are most important for someone to learn to build themselves as a leader right from when they are a fresher? And the second part to it, which areas do you see are still a gap and maybe your top preferences, personal preferences, where you would like to see more happening in the field of education and training? So the education field is very vast, first of all. It's very vast. Okay, and this right from school children who want help to college students who want projects to be done to people looking for a job to people in a job looking for a change. So the need is there at all levels and the need is huge. So you don't have to do a big market survey on which segment you want, I would say. So again, I will ask you to say reflect on, you know, which one will give you the most joy. You have to get in touch with yourself. I think this is what education, unfortunately, uh, takes away from us, our ability to introspect. We think the answers are outside. We always think the answers are outside. The truth is, when it's uh, technology, yes, all answers are outside. When it's science, many answers are outside. But cognitive science, or how we learn, do you know we still don't know how we learn? Do you know mankind doesn't know how memories are formed still? And then when it comes to arts, it's all creative, senses and feeling. So learning as a process is a personal experience. And very often, if you, if you are thinking of, okay, which level, which type of audience? Do I want to teach women? Do I want to teach men? Do I want to teach people who are very bright? Do I want to teach people who are challenged? That is an answer you will have to give or if you have a team of folks who have a similar feeling. So for example, we also run a university which is a not-for-profit, right? We also run a foundation which actually trains more people, half a million people they train for free. Those are all unmet aspirations we had. We can afford to do that now. We couldn't start with that. So you will have to sense out which segment appeals to you and test it out. So this conversation with yourself is a very important starting point. Education is a social burden. Uh, I, I, I resonated with that line. I run a company, a tech company called Mocha, which focuses on soft skills. Uh, but I've always felt startups are in conflict with education because education and building an educational brand requires time and requires effort and thought. But startups require growth at all costs. And I have been in this conundrum for three years now where uh, I think I'm a teacher at heart and I started this company because I enjoy being in the education space. So I was actually glad when uh, EdTech fund, when there was a funding window for EdTech, that's when people who were not serious about education stepped away. So I was actually glad that happened. My question to you is you've been in the education space for a while. For a young EdTech founder like me, was to constantly ask this question every single day. Should I pursue growth or should I pursue education? And my inkling is always to go towards education because if you strip away the startup, I'd still be a teacher at heart. So what would your answer be to me? Because I do want to build a brand and an uh, ed tech company. And when I hear all the startup knowledge, um, it's in co conflict, in direct conflict with building an educational brand. So I would love to hear from you because you've been in the space for a while. So I would love to hear what you have to say about it. You know, so, first I have to say very nicely he's articulated. Yeah, so, very the, nice. so I need to spend more time with you. I'm willing to spend more time with you. In fact, if you can note down on, um, on 3rd, 4th and 5th of April, I'll have to just reconfirm the dates. You come to Nimrana to a university, we will be calling about 10 or 15 startups who we select but I see your interest I see your question I value it and would be happy to just have you spend time at the university and interact with other startups it's a non-trivial answer I just want to say it's non-trivial so if your passion is right but you have to remember you have to be sustainable right so your sustenance has to come from somewhere in our university, it can never be sustained. University is bottomless pit, but NIT as founders, you know, we ran a software company as well. We exited that very profitably and our personal funds went there. So you'll need to make it sustainable. 
if you have a method which makes it sustainable, supports you different, but if you want it to be sustainable in itself, then you have to have a set of audiences who value what you give them and have the wherewithal to pay. It's very important. In fact, in, even in our case, 1991, when we were 10 years old, we started the GNIT program. And in, by the end of the 90s, we had 2,000 learning centers in 40 countries. They had fixed capacity. And every class would have four or five or six seats free. So we introduced something we call the Bhavishya Jyoti Scholarship. We introduced it in 91. And at peak, I, I have to show you a picture in Nigeria. For the test, preliminary test, the biggest football field had to be done to get people to do the preliminary test was that popular because people could do this education for, for free. We could afford it because that capacity was going free. It's like a plane, if a seat goes free, nothing happened. The marginal cost is close to zero. So we introduced it only 10 years later. We could see young people coming from day one, but we couldn't afford to do it. So the moment we, be, we started seeing that we can, so if your heart beats to give education for such people who can't afford it, reserve that for the time when you can afford to do that. I think the mistake we often do is, my heart beats for people who can't afford it, but then someone has to help you. Till then, you have to become sustainable. And the journey to sustainability will do one thing for you. It will make you really good at what you do because you have to serve one, one learner at a time. You have to satisfy their requirement. You have to satisfy the parent's requirement. You have to, and it's very difficult. Education is not an easy subject. It's a very, very difficult subject. But when you do something for one person and they move on in life, that's what keeps you going to your question, don't get fatigued. So you have to establish that. So I'd be very happy. You meet me and I'll we'll set up for you to spend time in. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. You know, uh, Mr. Pavan, I have to say on behalf of everyone in this room, I, I'm just thinking that we are having master class sessions. And it's like a school of life because these are so valuable. And thank you because there's so much of wisdom and practicality in what you've shared and talked to us today. Thank you. Thank you for being here.